Hi there. I'm Jim Spawn, pastor of the Point Church in Greenwood, Indiana, and you're joining us for week one of our look at Ezra, Rebuilding After Ruin. Today we're going to be looking at the topic of providence, the providence of God. And uh, I encourage you to go ahead and grab your Bibles, grab a notepad and a pen, because we're going to be digging into God's Word in just a minute. As we begin this series, I want to remind you to go ahead and subscribe to our channel and follow along and watch for new videos as you go along. And if God really speaks to you through this teaching, and which I pray He does, uh, you'll go back and revisit some of the other teachings that we've had and watch for new ones as they come up. We are beginning this new series entitled um, Ezra, Rebuilding After Ruin. Let's look at God's Word this morning. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm, and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any vocality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would uh, open our ears and our eyes to your teaching today as it relates to our personal situations and our surroundings and our world. May we be drawn towards you and as we are drawn towards you and our hearts lean in towards your goodness, may we sense the power of your spirit ministering to ours to our thoughts and to our emotions, and may we be drawn into an appropriate response that is what you are leading us to in peace and in justice and faithfulness and in holiness. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oswald Chambers once wrote in his up, my utmost for his highest, these words. Thank God he gives us difficult things to do. Now don't get me wrong, I like to do easy things just like anybody else. I like to do the things that come naturally to me. However, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the hard things, the difficult things just the same, because they cause me to consider my own limitations, but they also cause me to depend on living God. It's amazing how when we do things only that come easy to us, how quickly we can succeed, how quickly we can become almost bigger than life for those people who watch us. And now I'm sure some of you might realize that, and I'm sure a lot of professionals out there in our world, things that come easy to them, they have utilized to be, to move them quickly to a new place of success. But as we consider this, that, that doing the difficult things, the things that God is leading us to do, they become a little bit more strenuous, more difficult, yes, harder. Why? Because there is this risk of failure, the ri risk of ridicule and the risk of shame that comes with it, especially when we are saying that God has led me to do it. But it also brings spiritual maturity and strength of faith. Warren Wearsby, a modern day theologian who just recently passed away several years back, wrote this, and I think it applies to us very clearly today. Unlike modern day press agents and spin doctors, God doesn't manufacture synthetic heroes. Did you hear that? 
Unlike modern day press agents and spin doctors, God doesn't manufacture synthetic heroes. They're real heroes, the ones that God manufactures. And he manufactures them through doing difficult things. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah, which are many times seen as one book, yet separated for our understanding and study, records the difficult work of two characters primarily, Ezra and Nehemiah, who record in their own personal ways the difficult work of rebuilding, of restoring a temple, walls and gates, a city, and a people for the glory of God. And through the stories, we see this theme of God's providence, of God's being there and guiding and directing, and how things have all fallen into place because of how God has proclaimed them to be. His providence. Merriam-Webster defines providence this way. He says, divine guidance or care. God conceived as the power sustaining and guiding human destiny. The Lord is the Lord of heaven and of earth. How is his providence seen? I believe it's seen in three primary ways. It's seen in his faithfulness and then in three ways through his faithfulness. The first one is God is faithful to his word. Now, Jeremiah, the prophet, had prophesied for nearly 40 years of the coming exile that would come. The coming exile that the children of Israel are now coming out of in the book of Ezra. He told them for 40 years, this is coming, this is coming, this is coming. He also announced that it would be 70 years long. And whether God promises Blessing or God promises correction, God is faithful to his word. And in Joshua chapter 23, verses 14 through 16, we hear these words. This is Joshua talking to the leaders. He's reminding them of blessing, but he's also prophesying to them to what could be coming. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. He's talking about them as they come into the promised land for the first time. But he goes on. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to, to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. It's a prophecy. It's a prophecy of the coming exile. It's a prophecy that if they go and they start bowing down to other gods and doing the things that God did not ask them to do, but is contrary to the things he wanted them to do, then there would be correction. But, it go, but we also see God faithful to his word in other ways. King Solomon proclaimed in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, Praise be to the God to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. And then again, we hear how faithful God is through Jesus in his own words, where he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. It is the promise that God will be faithful to his word in all that he does. In all of time, as we might know or not know about it, God is faithful to his word. But God's not only faithful to his word, but he's also faithful to his covenant. See, in spite of their sins, in spite of their rebellion, and in spite of the prophecies being spoken that they would be 
receive, God is faithful to come back and restore the chosen people, even after he sends them away into exile. The nation may have broken the covenant, but God does not. God does not break his covenant with you. You might break it with him, but his faithfulness is always seen through his work involved in that relationship and in that covenant. And God would see in the children of Israel his promises, his mission for them fulfilled. What would be his mission? It would be declared to, to those in John chapter 4, verse 22, through Jesus' own words, that salvation would come from the Jews. The house of Israel would proclaim salvation to a world. Jesus is speaking here to a Gentile woman and helping her understand that salvation for a world would be known through a certain people, the Jewish nation. And that would be the mission that God would have for that nation so that restoration and peace and salvation would know, be known to an entire world. And he was faithful, faithful to that covenant promise. God's not only faithful to his word and through his covenant promise, but he accomplishes those things because he's faithful to guide humanity. He's faithful to guide humanity. I think this is the most important point for us to remember today. As we look at the word and as we understand things, we see here in this story of Ezra that the Lord rose up a king in Babylon. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, I said the Lord rose up. Because in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 9, we hear this. The word of the Lord. I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, Jeremiah records the Lord speaking to him three times, referring to Nebuchadnezzar as my servant. It's found in chapter 27, verse 6, and it's found in chapter 43, verse 10. There is this understanding that, that God's guiding of humanity involves a divine resourcefulness, a divine resourcefulness that goes beyond our understanding. So much so that we see a, a wicked king being referred to as my servant. But also as we move forward towards the end of that exile, we hear these words being prophesied by Isaiah about the next king who would come about. In Isaiah 41, verse 2, we hear this. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to windblown chaff with his bow. Now, who is the prophet Isaiah talking about? Who is it that is stirring them up? It is the Lord God. But who is it that he's talking about? This one from the east. Well, we find out in chapter 45 of Isaiah. We hear these words. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. Cyrus, it's the king of Persia that we just read about in Ezra chapter 1. It is a foreign king, not a king of the chosen people, a king who would come in and strip other kings. Who? The kings of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and all that they did. And we would hear here something that we need to all know in today's day and age. God's people need to remember 
that the Lord God is sovereign over all nations and can do what he pleases in guiding humanity even with the most powerful rulers. There's a lot of people on both sides of the fence as they look at rulers and authority in our world. We know that God can do what he wants to because in Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 through 32, we hear about the madness that, that comes upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, this is the same king here. At the end of his insanity, he says these words. In chapter 4, beginning verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, and I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. People don't have to be Christians for God to use them to accomplish his purposes. Whether mayors or governors or senators or presidents, we can know that God can guide humanity to accomplish his good purposes. I think this all brings us to this understanding in his providence that we have a action that needs to take place. Especially as we look at our world today, but also throughout our lifetime. And Paul calls us to it in 1 Timothy chapter 2 as he writes to his brother in arms, to his dear son Timothy. And he says these words. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodness and holiness. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodness and holiness. I want to linger there for a little bit. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is our call. petitions and prayers and thanksgiving and intercessions so that we may live in goodness and holiness, peaceful and quiet. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. 
Throughout history, God has displayed his care and direction for humanity, his providence. It's involved blessing and it's involved correction. It, it takes and brings us through sometimes very difficult times, but it's for our good. It brings us to a place of maturity and strength in our faith and in our trust in him. Through it all, it's not meant to stir hearts of man towards hatred, but towards God. We're not to be hating and, and angry with one another. We're not to be filled with violence in words and in actions, but we're to be people of peace, people of holiness, people of goodness towards all mankind in order to honor him and to worship him with our lives, to bring him the glory he deserves, no matter what condition our world is in. The children of Israel were taken into captivity into Babylon against their will. That world wasn't very pleasant. They learned to live in it, some to succeed and flourish in it, some continued to long for the past. Those who were peace-loving, who honored God in their lives, succeeded greatly. They were lifted up. We're called to trust him, the Lord God, when our eyes are blinded to what is going on because of all of the chaos and our ears are stopped with media and with the garbage and with confusion and our minds are found in a fog because we can't understand left from right. We're called to trust in a faithful God who's faithful to his word, to his covenant, even with you. And to guide humanity towards his good purposes. Our part in that, our part in that is to fulfill Paul's challenge to pray, to live good, peaceful lives. That happens through humility and humbling ourselves to God and not responding in anger, to lifting up holy hands to him and not fists to a world so that all might see Christ and his peaceful sacrifice given for our goodness. Let's pray. Let's do what Paul has asked us to do. Father in heaven, we bring ourselves to you in humbleness and in a quietness. We thank you for your word, and for your providence, your care and your direction. The scriptures and stories we have read from history, Lord, may they be a way that we might look at our present age and not be so disturbed. May we understand that you are not a God who comes and goes, but you are a God who is always on his throne. That you're aware of our circumstances and you're aware of our future that you know how you've used the past and how you can use even our past. Father, we trust you today. We trust you by lifting up holy hands and saying, Lord God, we submit ourselves to you. Make us peace-loving people. Grant us a gentleness and a sweetness of spirit that is seen in your son, Jesus Christ. May your holiness be known in us. 
wash over us fresh and new and allow us to be able to reach out hands not only to you then, but to all the world that they might know the goodness of God, how you redeem relationships and make things right, how you accomplish your good and pleasing will in our world. Lord, we pray that you would prompt our hearts, but not only prompt our hearts, but prompt those hearts of those in authority and in leadership from every political side and every political agenda. May your word, your promises, your blessings and your correction be accomplished through those in leadership. May it be your will that we see and may we trust in what we see, not in them, but in you, Lord God. May our hearts find rest and peace as we read and scroll and hear the news of what is happening in our world and in our nation. May we be reminded to lift up our president, those in Congress, our mayors and governors from every state and every city. May we not be not ones who would lift up rocks and stones, whether they be by words or by physical means to cast them at others. But Lord, may we be people who only lift up our hands in praise to a God who has set us free from the judgment that we deserve so that we would not judge them in the acts that we might see as ignorant or foolish but that we would trust you to accomplish what you desire, beginning in us and being poured out into them as we intercede and we give you thanks for your direction and your guidance in our world. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to linger, we'll go ahead and we'll add in at the end of this a time to receive communion. If you'd like to pause this video and go grab yourself some juice and some bread or cracker and so that we can open up and receive Holy Communion together. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Holy Communion. It's a time of that's sometimes referred to as uh, the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper, or the Lord's Table. It's a time where believers can come and receive elements and in order to remember the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's also an opportunity for those who would be wanting to desire to make a confession of their faith in Jesus as the Son of God himself who lived a holy and sinless life, and yet who came and taught, but also offered himself as the sacrifice, as the means by which to receive the punishment that we so rightly deserve. And in that confession of faith, of receiving these elements and saying that Jesus is the Son of God, and that we would receive him fresh and new, or for the first time, to know his personal relationship with us in a very special way. In John chapter 6, Jesus says these words of himself. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. 
I am the bread that came down from heaven. If you have a cracker or you have a piece of bread, this is the bread of heaven. We consecrate it and we ask that it be known to us as Jesus. Lord God, we pray right now that you would remind us of the life and of the humanity of Jesus, but also of the deity of Jesus. That he is one with you, that he is the word, the word that you are faithful to accomplish and finish. Father, allow this wafer or cracker or bread to be something of significance to us today as we remember and as we celebrate the life and the death and the resurrection of your son, Jesus. May we know him more personally even now. Jesus said at his last supper with his disciples, this is the bread of the new covenant. He is the bread of the new covenant taken he gave it to him and he said as often as you eat remember me take now eat and remember Christ's life and give thanks Jesus said whoever believes in me will never be thirsty and at that last meal he picked up a cup So this cup is the cup of the new covenant. It is a symbol of his shed blood, of his receiving the punishment for our sins and for our rebellion, that we might know God again, might we redeem to him through one perfect sacrifice, one who would lay down his life for us, Jesus. Father in heaven, we pray that in the time of taking and drinking this now, we remember the sacrifice and the life given through Jesus, and that we would know you. That you would be poured out in blessing and a holy sense wash over us that we might know you more richly and more fully today. Accomplish your will through us in salvation and in sanctification, and may our lives be lives of peace, we pray. Take now and drink. As often as you do, remember and give thanks to Jesus until he comes again. Now, Lord, we finish this time through a time of praise for all that you have done. We pray that you would preserve us, that you would guide us and direct us in all that we do and all that we say, that we would know you intimately, personally, that we would fulfill your good will for us, that we would be seen as holy vessels in a world filled with chaos and confusion until your son would come again and restore this whole world. We pray all these things and we consecrate ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Grace and peace be to you today.